expertise. Here I'm going to focus more on the semantic side of things. Uh, and uh, this is going to be a, a story in three acts, I would call it. Uh, first, I want to talk about the semantic web, uh, which is really what's underlying a lot of the things that we're doing. Um, then I want to, to start from, from the world we already have today and build it up from there to take you all the way to uh, this, this rather interesting but sometimes uh, confusing environment of semantics. And then the last one uh, is called the round trip, is how we actually do this, how we actually implement this. And then uh, I'll try and keep this uh, in, in, in about half an hour, 40 minutes, so there's enough time for Mitchell as well and enough time for questions. So let's get into it, into the first part of it. Uh, the semantic web, and I sort of said here, is this the federated network of platforms? And that might be. Certainly one of the options that about presented uh, would be that. Um, if, if you look at the technologies that we've all been working with for the last whatever, our careers really, I think some of us start right on the left of PCs and stuff like that, and, and how all of this has evolved. If you look at this graph here, which is a, from a book called Semantic for Dummies, um, which is sort of the level that I work at, um, you, you see how these technologies have, have evolved. But what you will also see is that most of the stuff that you're doing today is not actually on the far right of this screen. Uh, you know, this web 4.0, which is 2020, but much further back, you know, we're still dealing with JavaScript and, 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 and HTTP and things like that. So it's a bit of a, there's a bit of a mis mismatch between the technologies we work with and the ones that are supposedly the ones that we should be using today, which is the, you know, distributed search, semantic databases, all that stuff. I won't, I won't go into all the details here, but just to give you a flavor of, of where things are, um, same for database technology. Uh, a lot of the stuff we're dealing with is still based on our understandings of relational databases, which is the 1980s, okay? Then we had the NoSQL, meaning not only SQL or not always SQL, uh, which is a whole different breed of database that are more and more used today. And then as the graph world we're supposed to be living in today in 2020, 2021, if you want. And somehow there's, there's, again, there's a mismatch between technologies that are, are trending and the ones that we're actually using. So um, what is all this? Now, a graph database really is just another database. It's just of a completely different scale. Uh, the databases that our companies use are like on the ones on the left, they're all SQL databases in many cases, part of our ERP systems. And then some of you may recognize query language like SQL, uh, with very simple statements. Uh, a graph database really is, is very similar, very similar query uh, queries that you can do, except that you're now connecting lots of different uh, data centers, very much the federated uh, network of platforms in the EU, for example, where we really want to be able to, to access that data that is all over the place. And as well pointed out, there are different approaches for doing this. This is almost a theoretical view of what what, uh, what Wout has presented, but the concept is the same. Is we want to be able to access data of parties that are somewhere out there. And so, if you if you look at it like that, you could say that the federated network of platforms is somehow data that is linked together, which is a graph. And 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 you 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 have heard uh, Wout use that term a lot. And so you could say, well. Perhaps all of this is really where we have a, a big graph where we have a road carrier and a customs and other parties out there that have their own bit of data space that, that Wout also mentioned. And all this stuff is linked together through linked data. And all of this creates this very big graph. Um, this sounds a bit theoretical, but it's very much where all this is heading. And the European Data Spaces project is definitely looking at that and wants to see this. But even the federated network of platforms is trying to do exactly this. So what do we need this for? In order to do this, we do need this common semantic model. Because if you think about it, if we're going to be, you know, looking at each other's data, if we don't understand what it is, if we don't even use the same semantics, it's not going to work. We need the same language and the same meaning. We need to link this data. There's lots of ways of doing it, but in many cases there are URIs involved. So that really whether it's blockchain or, or converters or you name it, somewhere along the line we need URIs to connect the data. 
URI is a, another word for URL. Doesn't mean the same thing, but for the purpose of our discussion, it's the same thing. Um, and we need a common syntax. And then we see languages like RDF, which is not really language, it's more of a, it's more of a concept than anything else, uh, which is expressed in different syntaxes that you do know. You've heard of XML, you've heard of JSON, you may not have heard of Turtle, but uh, and JSON, there's an LD there, linked data, which is, uh, again, a specialization of JSON, but they're relatively well-known known languages. Uh, then we have OWL, which is a strange acronym for Web Ontology Language. Uh, that's a very long story in itself, which is really to describe more complex relationships between these different semantics. And then there's Shackle, which is due for managing data constraints. And so in this world of semantics, you'll hear these, these acronyms quite a lot. But let's switch gears. Uh, let's start from what we know. And I want to start with clay. Uh, just in case there's any Babylonians on the call, I don't want to feel you left out. This all started 4,000 years ago. This is a complaint letter from some trader who ordered some stuff and the logistics network broke down, the wrong stuff was delivered, people weren't happy, uh, a huge mess. I won't go into that, it's, it's an interesting story in itself. But it sort of shows us that a lot of the stuff that we're doing and the problems we're trying to deal with, they're extremely old, we just haven't managed to solve them yet. But that's okay, that happens. Uh, in the meantime, of course, we've invented paper. Um, one of the really nice things about paper is that it's 100% interoperable. Everybody gets paper which is why it's so successful. But of course, I don't want to go into that now. You know, you can see here a bit of lading, a CMR, you can see Ember Build, they, they even look similar if, you, if, you, if you're willing to. to, to certainly the, the shape is similar. Um, but where does that data come from? It's no longer written by hand, so that's the good news. It actually comes currently from corporate systems, ERP systems and other systems that people have developed. We have GUIs that actually enter the data. We may be receiving the data electronically via electronic formats. And I've used some formats here that are used in the airline business. Uh, the one on the left is, uh, is, is called Cargo Imp, which is a, a, a telex type format, uh, which is cute, except that it's still used for 99% of all of the uh, data exchange in air transport. We have an XML version of it. One of the reasons why the uh, Imp is used is because it's readable. If you've never seen this before, even you could figure out that SHP might mean shipper, in which case it's a shipper pet shop from the airport in Rio de Janeiro, and the consignee is somewhere in Tokyo. It's readable, and it's one of our problems, is that people think they have to read this stuff, which kills me. No, you don't want to read this stuff, but they insist on reading it, which is why they don't want to use XML and other things, because it's unreadable. Anyway. Let me not uh, get stuck on that one. Um, so we're back at the database again. You know, I started saying earlier, semantic web and all that stuff, database. And, you know, typical database. For many of you, this looks familiar. You have a GUI, you have forms, documents, some schema in the middle, you have maybe some export. To, fine, all that is fine. And this is where it gets interesting. And here I have a photo of Wout coming up, who gives us two choices. Actually, he doesn't. He only gave us one choice. It's a red or a blue pill. The blue pill is, I don't really want to know this stuff. I just want the data. I want to send the data and then I want to go fishing. That's it. Leave me in peace. The other one is, okay, let's get into that. Show me the matrix. And this is far more true than it might appear. It's not just funny, although it is very funny. Um, but look at the blue pill, blue pill first. Give me the data. Fine. You have data models, you have databases, you have, um, uh, you're used to having electronic documents. In this case, it's, it's a JSON document, but fine, you know, let's not go worry about that. You can convert it if you want to XML, if that's what you like. And there are schemas behind that. Okay, it looks a bit funny again, but all of this is the world you know. I don't have to go much further. You can go fishing after this. And those that don't want to swallow the red pill right now, this is a great time to go and make a coffee or something. Because um, if you do take the red pill, you may or may not regret that. But let's do it. In the red pill world, data is literally everything. Data schemas are derived from semantic models, whether we like it or not. They are derived from ontology of logistics, which is 
the knowledge we have about this domain. When we speak together, we're actually using an ontology because we understand what we mean. There's meaning in the words that we use. And we just want to write that ontology down because it allows us to do semantics and allows us to do data schemas. And once we have that, we also have a graph. We can turn that into a graph. We've got knowledge graphs. Now, it's not just called knowledge graphs because that looks nice. You can actually query that like you would query knowledge. So you can use tools and you can actually ask questions like, instead of typing SQL, you have questions like, is there a dangerous goods packing service near Dortmund and I can handle vaccines? Well, that's a very complex question, but knowledge graphs will give you the answer. You took the red pill. Sorry about that. This image you have seen, possibly with different colors, because it's appearing in different colors, but it's the image. This is the semantic modeling group has produced this. The logistics ontology, uh, that's the stuff you do know. You know, as I said, ontology is about things that we know. Products, cargo, equipment, transport means, customs, items, legal and natural person. None of these words are strange to you. There's not anyone here that hasn't heard these words. Okay, so fine. We're starting all on the same page. We can, um, my browser works, my thing works, yes. Um, we can d dive into that. So what's behind these things? Now, uh, I don't know what the resolution on screen is like, but I'm pretty sure you can't see the details because I can't, and if I can't, you can't. Um, you know, we have digital twin, we have uh, we have physical infrastructure, things like ports, airports, and of course we have events, uh, uh, estimated time of arrival. We've looked at this before, so I don't want to dig into this now, but somewhere in your email you have a copy of this and you could actually look at the details. And we'll look at some examples of that. But that's sort of the direction that we're taking this. Now, ah, this doesn't work when I'm not in presentation mode, so I'm going to have to go to presentation mode anyway. And that's not going to work, but I'm going to have to. I don't suppose you... Do you see, still see my screen? Yes, but yes. with uh, your notes, so we see the... Uh, ah, you see the that master. one there. Okay, that's actually okay, if you don't mind. So, um, we start with a, a relatively simple example. Container type X is being loaded into a vessel with the name X, import X. Actually, I think there should be X, Y, Z, because it's very unlikely that these are all the same, but that's because I'm a mathematician, so these things that pop out at me. Um, anyway, we have these, we have these different uh, things. And again, this is, this is normal. This is the world you live in. Now let's sort of bring the ontology there. Turns out that the vessel uh, name is of a type vessel and the vessel is a transport means. And of course the vessel itself has properties like name and type. Uh, there's a story about the vessel being a subclass of transport means. This is all sort of stuff you, you will easily understand, I'm sure. And the same happens to the container, uh, which is a physical object. We have a port uh, uh, with, with, uh, which performs a certain function, and I can go through this and we just click through it till we have a full picture. Um, so here you see the link between the stuff you actually want to do and the ontology or the semantic model, right? Um, we'll look into why we want to do this next. So here's the full picture. Uh, if you take out the original uh, uh, sort of structure, we looked at the container moving. Here is that same thing implement or expressed in the in the semantic model that we have. Um, and incidentally, you'll see the slide format change every now and then. I'm going to go back to uh, full screen. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and that is because I've used different slides from different presentations, but I want to make sure you understand where they come from. This is one that was prepared for the uh, DTLF. Um, and so sort of a bit of a digression, but this is all linked to the DTLF. And so some points, open world assumption, uh, we want to be able to share data in the future as well, which is of course one of the things I've been talking about. Um, we want to base ourselves on standards the standards that come from the different modality, which we have used, as you will, those that are in the semantic modeling group, have actually provided that input. What standards are they using? Uh, we want to use standard code lists. We want to be able to support existing standards. 
um, uh, standard technologies, but also the models that are being used out there, like UNC FACT, WCO, IATA One Record, etc. And somehow all of this fits very nicely into this semantic model that we've been talking about. If we dive a little bit deeper here, and now we go back to the graphs again. And in, in a sense, this story is like the, the old stories where you keep repeating the same thing and hopefully something sticks in the end. Uh, so here we're back at graphs again. So what we have done in a semantic model is essentially prepare that graph. And so in the very middle here, you can see this is semantic modeling of the reference framework. Again, you recognize the terms. I've just put them on the screen, digital twins, events, classifications, right? So it's the same thing. And then if you, this can be expressed then into the things that you know, um, for example, the itinerary or, or roles that happen in logistics, okay? So again, it's, it's that same thing, but in a different form. And we also have something called shape graphs. Shape graphs are there to explain the constraints in our model. Um, what quantities are we using? Um, what currency, sort of the, 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 real, the real standards out there and the limitations that we have. If we look at an example here, this is a nice example where, um, again, this is actually a, an animated graph, but you can walk through it because it's, we start on the left and we go to the right. I'm not going to change mode for this one. But what we see on the left is a model example where we have uh, logistics roles, for example, financial roles or commercial roles, and all of these exist. And then if you go to the right, we have uh, digital twins like dangerous goods or packaging types, nature of cargo, things like that. This is then expressed into a shape graph. OK, so here we, this is actually a um, I think it's. Um, well, it's a graph for sure. Um, this is a typical example of RDF, actually, that I mentioned earlier. You could try and read it, but the point is not that. The point is that uh, we have the model that started with the real world that we came from in our own domain that was initially put into a spreadsheet and that is now put into a graph. And the graph actually defines all of the connections. And you could actually plot this into something that actually looks like a network and a graph. OK, so here we're really at the very end of the modeling process. Now, what's interesting is that um, we said earlier that we want to make sure this also links to existing data models. And one of them actually is, or well, not yet, because FT is being developed, but at some point there's going to be FT. So here's an example of uh, an FT model that was developed by subgroup one of the DTLF on the left here, the left, the left two columns, and then how that translates to, um, to a semantic model. And this is, this is a really interesting example because the semantic model we developed before we actually looked at the FT in detail, not the other way around. In most cases, we've taken existing models and, and used it to create the semantic model. Here, we have taken the semantic model and see how it maps against the FT. And that is what's going to happen in the future, because at some point, the semantic model is ready. Somebody comes along with a new data standard they have, and we have to make sure that they fit together. And as I said earlier, this is a story where we repeat ourselves, so I'm going to come back to this again. Now, at this point, since you took the red pill, you may be wondering, why are we doing all of this just to exchange data? After all, our dear friend from, the Babylon, from Babylon, he was capable of exchanging data on clay. So do we really need this? Well, it does a lot more than exchanging data because it allows us to interact, well, logistics with logistics, which is very much the federated network of platforms. In other words, uh, road logistics with air logistics, right? We actually need this to do that. But we can also link subdomains, right? Um, for example, uh, we can have um, the, the various modes interacting. We can have the various standards of the different organizations, Federated, DTLF, UNC, FEC, WCO, IATA, you name it. Uh, they can all interact if we have such models. And there's more. And this sort of goes back to a question of Rudy as well. We also need it needed to able to automate the generation of APIs and the documentation that goes with it. And ideally, documentation that machines can read, so we don't have to read it, right? Well, you can do this if you do, uh, if you have these models. We want to be able to populate search engines and indexes. 
indices, indexes, I'm not sure which one. Uh, I think we say indexes, but then I guess it's wrong. Um, generate class models for people that actually have to implement this and program computers, they will have to generate class models. They don't really want to take our beautiful RDF and start coding stuff to read every line and to figure out how to recreate the network and their computer. That can all be automated. Uh, we want to build mobility data spaces. We want to do more AI and we want to build the matrix. Because the next time you watch the matrix, actually very much the story behind it is very, very similar. They just didn't have the, uh, the insight of us, although they did take the red pill. Um, you can't do this without tools. Let me let me say that uh, the idea that you take a uh, what we call cargo in document and start reading that uh, that something is shipped from Rio de Janeiro to 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 uh, Narita is totally crazy. You should not read this stuff. Take the human out here and use tools. So we need tools for semantic models. A tool that's often used as protege, but it really isn't the only one but it's certainly free, which is always a nice feature. Um, you can use visualizers like WebVal. Uh, it isn't great. I don't think it's great. Val doesn't think it's great, but it gives you a, a perspective of, of what these networks really look like and how they interact. But there's many others that are far better than that. Um, you can use browsers. Uh, we have used Widdico, but there are others. I know that Vout has, about Steam is another one. Um, and then you have query languages like SparkQL or GraphQL and all sorts of other things. And, and at some point, we will start using these things or your colleagues may be starting using these things. But without the tools, you can't do any of it. If, if, if you don't want tools, then go back to phishing and just leave it to your colleagues from the IT department to provide you with documents. Right, this was the, the red pill bit. So I'm gonna come back to the round trip. And the round trip is, uh, is, is something that I think will, will speak to all of you. Um, I've borrowed this fry slide from um, another EU project called START with a four on it. I'm not sure what the four means. Uh, oh, I could read it. Semantic transformations for rail transportation. There you go. Nothing to do with Federated, nothing to do with IATA either, but uh, at a conference, we met a group called Cefriel, and they put us in touch with this, and uh, it was a very interesting proposal. So here you're looking at, for example, one of the challenges we have. We have all these different syntactic models. IATA has one, uh, IMO has one, UNC Fact is another one, DTLF is another one, of course, there's many, many, many of them. But in the old world, what we would try and do is interface them, okay? And I remember many meetings where IATA and you and CIFEC would sit together and say, okay, we have to make our models interoperable, or we have to align them or comply them, whatever term we want to use. And then we meet many, many, many times in the end, we separate in much anger because we can't do it. Uh, or we don't separate and somehow figure out a way to actually link our models together. It's not easy. But then you have to do that with all the others. And actually, if you really think about it, it's an unsolvable puzzle. You can do it for one or two, but not for many. It's not going to work. And so, um, and I like this, this particular graph, which is why I've taken it. Uh, if you did have a semantic model, the reference ontology in the middle, then all you have to do is make sure that each of these models can interact with that one. And then box your uncle, and you can start interoperating. And this is where the round trip comes in. The round trip is where you start with something that you know, for example, an ECMR, which may be an XML document. You somehow translate that uh, into a Java object. I mean, it doesn't have to be Java, it could be anything. You translate it into something which can interact with that intermediate ontology. That intermediate ontology can then interact with another thing that can translate, translate it to another document like an EMO bill, right? That's the round trip. You stop at one, you go all the way in and all the way out again. And theoretically, you can go the other way back and you should get exactly the same data. And I think that if you, if the red pill has confused you, just remember this one. It's all about trying to go from something real, an ECMR, via something that we refer to as the semantic model or the ontology, to something else that you do know. This is perhaps the, the one thing to remember. 
And so our roles are different. In the semantic modeling group, we're very much concerned about that intermediate ontology. People like Vauk and his colleagues and, and ourselves for that matter, and some of you as well, are very concerned about how do we do this? What tools do we need? How do we make these conversions? How do we implement this? One of my colleagues is on the call. I haven't introduced her, Andra. Uh, she's our architect and, and developer. And she does stuff like that. She, she actually implements these, these Java object converters and stuff like that. And that is a specialization that not all of us have to understand and we shouldn't even try. But, and then we have the left part, which applies to many of you working on living labs. This is the stuff you actually use. XML or JSON or whatever format you want, I don't mind. But that's the stuff that you get in touch with. Now, your mission, and this is the conclusion really, is that you should just take the blue pill for now, okay? Just do your stuff, but you're gonna have to take that red pill at some point. And so here is the, the scenario that I would like to lay out and then I'm going to stop. Um, build your living labs. This is a living lab meeting after all, and make sure that you understand your own schemas, in particular the ones for exchanging data. If somehow somebody has given you a system and you don't understand those schemas, you're going to have a problem. Because ultimately, if you want to exchange data, you need an API, but you also need to understand what happens there. So we're still in the blue pill world. You need to understand your own schemas. It's a reasonable request. You also need to be ready to change them or to adapt them so that they are, they are in line with the federated, uh, the, the, the schemas generated by the federated ontology. So you have to kind of get ready for that. Make sure you understand your current schema, but you must be willing at some point to make some adaptations, not everything, only the data you want to exchange, okay? Which is maybe only a small part of your schema anyway, but that you might have to adapt. And then when it comes to the red pill stuff, at some point, you should look into these technologies um, there's no getting away from it. If you have the luxury of, of being a few weeks from retirement, okay, don't bother. But if you have a few years left, you, you're going to have to do this, okay? So look into the semantic web, have a look at RDF, have a look at JSONLD, have a look at some of the stuff that Valt's been talking about as well. You need to get a sense of what data spaces are. They're going to be a bigger topic as we, as we move along. Once you understand that, a lot of this makes sense. So um, that's where I'm going to stop. Thank you very much. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to uh, entertain them. Thank you for that, uh, Hank. I think it was a great presentation. Uh, this is this is actually fun. <laughs> Maybe it says something more about me than, than anything else. But I, I really really enjoyed the presentation. Just just a quick quick question before we open for for the rest. Uh, if I want to do this uh, on, a, on a smaller scale, how difficult is it, really? I, I mean, is it, is it, um, do you have to take the blue pill or the red pill, or can you, can you, uh, can you try with a sort of a pink pill a, a bit and, and, and fiddle with it? <laughs> well, like, I like like the yeah. one in the middle there. I, I can answer that question because we have been running a project like this at IATA for the last three years. And we're working with 50 companies and each company there's maybe five, six people that are involved in this. So a few hundred people, let's say. It's a lot. It, it's a lot. And uh, we, we've gone all the way. We have all of the schemas. We have all the stuff. We have all the, all, all the stuff you want. And what we know for a fact is that maybe five to 10% of our stakeholders of those 200 have actually taken the red pill. Most of them have said, no, the blue pill is fine for us. And so what do they do is that the files that we generate, the JSON or XML files that we have generated are all they use. They don't understand the ontology. They don't understand how we've got there, but they, they are willing to accept that there are experts that understand it. And all they need to do is work with the output of that. And so to bring that back to, to uh, federate it, um, I think it's the responsibility, and I'm interested in hearing Vout's view on this as well, I think it's partly the responsibility of the semantic modeling group to make sure that somewhere along the line, we can give these specifications for 
the actual schemas that you will use in your environment, even if you don't understand how to generate it. So you can just live with the blue pill. In our case, 90% of our customers do. And at some point, you know, hopefully that number will reduce and more and more will take the red pill. But for now, it doesn't worry me. But I'm interested in hearing Ralph's view on that. What do you think that you can get away with the blue pill for a long time? <laughs> I, I, I can totally agree with what you're saying, Hank. Uh, I think the red pill is for most people too complex at the moment. So, uh, so you say in the last block here, learn about semantic web. Uh, lots of developers are not yet aware of the capabilities of the semantic web. Uh, so we have to uh, uh, be a bit more what, what you could say backward compatible and support of what they know. So we have to produce blue pills out of the red one. Mm. Eventually, uh, they will hopefully migrate to the to the red situation. But but what we will what we will see is combinations of blue and red. So that's a challenge we really have. There will always be different technologies uh, used in parallel. Correct. Thank you. But isn't it always uh, also a question of what role you have? I mean, not everyone needs to understand even, you know, in the far future, not everyone needs to understand every bit and bolt in the technology, just like, a, you know, a truck driver doesn't have to know how to program the, the, the engine controls for his machine, yes. uh, but he can use it. Yeah, I, I think that's correct. Um, and I think that sense about is right that not all developers know about semantic web, but nor do all business people or all drivers or all captains. Um, I do think that even at maybe not the truck driver, I don't think that go as far as that, but certainly the people, uh, the, the people that we're talking to here, you know, the people in DTLF, I think they need to form an opinion of an understanding of semantic web and its capabilities, data spaces. They don't have to develop it. They don't have to program it. They don't even have to specify it. They just need to understand what it is. And, and honestly, uh, you know, a book like the semantic web for dummies, it's even 10 years old. So in that sense, it's a little bit out of date. But, but if you just read the paragraph titles, the, the, the heading titles, which takes you less than an hour, you know everything perhaps that you will ever need to know about at the business level. So it's not it's not huge. You just need to do it. It's, it's the same like uh, when we uh, first had mobile phones, we had these Nokia, uh, well known maybe to everyone. And then someone uh, came uh, with with a smartphone. Before we had a smartphone, we couldn't imagine what we could do. So it's the same over here. We don't really know what uh, we are developing. We are sort of developing something for the future, but we don't really know what it will look like. And and still we have to adopt it somehow based on, uh, um, how do you say it, the business benefits that we foresee. Hmm. Does anyone else have any comments or questions? Uh, can you move back? A couple of slides until, let me see, was it 29? No, it was the one before. 30 then, that one. I think this is this is very sort of enlightening to, to uh, if you look at all, all the living lab leaders that are probably in, in, in the room, if you are still alive, uh, to actually see that it's not, not that difficult to <coughs> make your uh, living lab more than uh, an on-site thing. Mm. If, if you look at this, this uh, picture here, there are actually the intermediate ontology there that you need to deal with. The rest is can be your ECMR or, or whatever you are uh, you are fiddling with, but you need at some point handle just another extra layer, and I think that is very interesting. That sort of boils it down to not saying easy, but uh, at least understandable, at least to at least to me. Uh, 
I, I think you're right. And you can actually draw a line here. Um, and it's enough to understand. If you understand how to how to how to populate your ECMR XML, you almost have enough. Yeah. Certainly from a, a conceptual, that's all you need to understand. Somebody may come from the right side, you know, the dark, the red side, and say, oh, here's a slight modification to your XML, or we need to have a converter. Could you explain to us how your XML works and what are the constraints that you have in your XML, okay? The, you, you'll have those conversations, but you don't have to go on the right side. Um, you, you can just stay on the, uh, on, on, the, on the happy side here. Let me just even some life. Uh... Oh, you can make it black. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hidden box. Something, something disappeared. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I don't, I don't want to waste your time on this, but... Uh, uh, you get the idea. I, I, I agree that this is perhaps the most revealing slide of the lot. I, I, maybe something to add here, because uh, you're right about the left side. Uh, you know your source and the other one knows the target. But we are experimenting now on the right side. It's not, not Java or what have you, but just to see if, if we can populate XML source data into a graph database. And then get it out. Yes. Yeah. That's a sort of, of standard mechanism you could use. And and the graph database, they, it can read the complete ontology. Correct. And you just have to create mappings in the graph database. So that's that's uh, for a very kind of maybe way ahead question, but how do you do this uh, in terms of performance? That's something we need to figure out uh, uh, how, if, if it really performs or not. No. That's Because I mean, the, 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 the intermediate ontology component in this picture really needs to be fairly complex to do its job. So it, there's a lot of performance issues yeah. you can run into there. Yeah. But we, may, we, maybe or maybe not, because uh, of course, from a modeling perspective, we make a very big semantic model. But in this example, the part that translates ECMR to EA mobile is a very small part. Yeah. Um, you don't actually need to implement all the other things. And therefore, if, if you're dealing with road transport, you're not going to implement all the other stuff. Uh, yeah. So, so I, I think that from a design perspective, yes, it's big and complex. I think from an implementation perspective, you'll see lots of subdomains and, and, and little small carve-outs that, that allow us to perform. Mm. A gentleman and, and from... Go ahead, Roland, sorry. Yeah, Roland speaking. From, from a survival point of view for the 21 living labs, can they survive by only living on the left, which is the blue zone? Um, and uh, so, so can we be successful with 21 living labs by not having any of the 21 uh, product leaders being involved in the intermediate ontology? And if not, how are they going to be assisted by uh, getting sufficient input for surviving in their living labs uh, in a federated way? Well, I'll give my view, but I'm interested in hearing other views as well. Um, I think that uh, mostly yes, I think the answer is mostly yes. But I think that each living lab also needs to start thinking about um, this picture here. And what I need to think about is what sort of interaction should we test? It doesn't have to be everything. But in this example, should one of the living labs think, oh, should we do this ECMR e airway bill conversion? Should we do that? Or is it a dangerous good case? I think that every living lab needs to come up with a use case that interacts with another living lab, a use case. Once they know that, once that living lab understands that, we could then say, well, what does that mean? What are the elements on one side that need to interact with elements on the other living lab? That will allow the semantic modeling group then to make sure that that particular part of the model is actually fit for purpose. We can then help them uh, to, with, with the actual schemas that they need to do that. But I think the first question they need to answer is, what can they do with another living lab as a use case? 
in parallel, but it's it's a discussion maybe not to have now, but we have some ideas about also providing uh, reference implementations for this, but uh, we'll come back to that I think the next time. Uh, but certainly that is the question. Which other living lab can you interact with? If you can answer that question, you're already halfway to having done it. But uh, any other vout I see, maybe you have a view on that. Yeah, it's really also the so, the, so I agree with what you're saying, Hank, is that you say on the one hand it depends on uh, your functionality of the use case, so on the, on the process. So I, in my presentation, I showed something about uh, event interface for visibility and meeting uh, government requirements. That, that's a, a particular case, but it also depends on uh, uh, how you uh, implement it and, and then we relate to the architecture because, well, we always argued about the concept of plug and play, which we did not address yet, but you could locally link with your adapter or connector or what have you that behaves completely according to the ontology and shares data according to the, the ontology with others. So this, this what you show us uh, seeing here is that this transformation is in, it's really in two steps. So on the top it's local with the carrier and on the bottom it's local with the airline. Mm. So you, you create an, an infrastructure that completely is built uh, around this ontology. That's also a solution. So, I, so see, I see that Rudy has his hand up and I'm also yeah. seeing it's a quarter past ten. Uh, we have to may, maybe move on to the next topic. But Rudy, would you like to comment? Yeah, so quickly saying as an input from me, I'm not so sure if it's this month, but certainly in months to come, is that um, we have been working, we are working on uh, the ECMR based on uh, the MMT. We are working on an ER wibble based on MMT, and we are working on the EFTI based on MMT. So we are planning to take the GSNLD version of, uh, of, UN, of the MMT and to put that as an input to see how we can align that one with the IATA uh, air cargo ontology and to mm -hmm. see how they can uh, how we can uh, make them communicating uh, together with very with one very very precise objective that is that the shipper who is uh, uh, or the forwarder let me say it, the forwarder in this case uh, that he can use the data out of his ERP system or its transport management system or its uh, supply chain visibility system and uh, communicate uh, uh, through a uh, connector with, uh, on one hand, a road service provider using the, uh, the UNC fact uh, XML message, and another one, the air cargo uh, provider using the, air, the, uh, the, the, the one record ontology. So this is the case I'm working on, um, and we'll see what comes out of it. It's going to be a learning case, yeah. That's a good example of a round trip, it, it, and that's the sort of thing, Rulon, that we need is uh, agree on these in these sort of inter-living lab use cases, and that's I think the discussion we need to have next. Michael, back to you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Hank. I think this was a splendid presentation, very interesting, and I hope uh, all the participants also 